Dr. Derek Lee. My pleasure to welcome Walter Ramos today. Now, Walter is a little bit unusual. He has two certifications. He's a orthotist, so he makes braces uh, for scoliosis. And he's also a physical therapist trained in scoliosis-specific exercises. So that's a fairly rare designation, Walter. I believe maybe 10 individuals around the world have it. So very uh, uh, elevated company there. Now, Walter currently works at uh, National Scoliosis Center in Fairfax, Virginia. And he also has his own company called Scoliosis Today, where he sees patients in Florida and St. Louis uh, and uh, Missouri. Uh, Walter today is going to talk about the most frequently asked questions about scoliosis bracing, including does bracing actually work? Uh, what happens if you don't brace? Uh, what's the difference between different brace types, you know, Boston brace, Rigo Chanel, uh, how bracing has changed over the years, and we'll dive into more details with Walter's presentation. Walter, I'll just hand the uh, mic over to you, and let's see, let's see what the frequently answered questions are about scoliosis bracing. Well, first of all, thank you for what you have done because you open a channel for not only for uh, parents, clients, but also healthcare professionals and uh, to get to recognize one with each other and uh, it's a way of merging them together to collaborate. So thank you for, for that. Actually, we tried to do this interview several times and, um, you know, finally it happens. My initial thought was, what is it? What's the intention? What, what is it that I want to accomplish? And um, for me, what I want to accomplish with my job is um, try to decrease the amount of anxiety, discomfort, pain, suffering that families have when they find out that they have scoliosis. And let's say here is the point where they found out the, that the child has scoliosis. And from that point on to what's the action to take it could be a lot of guilt, a lot of wondering what happened, a lot of uh, what did I miss, um, uh, why I didn't do what I should have done before. Um, so there's a lot of internal guilt. I mean, people literally not able to sleep, staring at the ceiling and uh, at night probably, you know, crying a little bit because of something that could be... Uh, uh, um, address uh, shorter. So I wanted that space to be so small that when you start taking action, things look better. So I'm going to talk about my experience with the uh, braces and uh, lately the last seven years with the Rigo concept. And I'm going to talk about the most uh, frequent questions that um, we see either in our clinic, phone con consultations, or even online. So the first one will be, okay, what will happen if uh, we don't treat a scoliosis? What will happen with my child if I don't brace uh, him or her? And for that, uh, Dr. Weinstein did an amazing job uh, with a document that talks about natural history. And uh, nicely, uh, Derek, you uh, interview him. And uh, I envy those spaces where you uh, interview such a wonderful, you know, contributors of scoliosis. Uh, the other uh, question is, does bracing work? And also Dr. Weinstein did an amazing uh, work with uh, uh, Lori um, presenting this document of the brace study. So um, the next question that I'm going to address is what's the difference in braces? I'm not gonna be as specific because it's kind of the, um, out of the scope of this uh, conversation to be specific, but I'm just going to talk about the traditional type of brace versus uh, the European, specifically the uh, Rigo concept uh, done or developed in Barcelona under the influence of uh, Dr. Genot from France and Katharina Schroth from Germany. Um, also, um the question of why don't braces why don't braces work i mean if if sometimes we see kids that are doing the right thing what's what's going on why it doesn't work uh, for that uh i'm going to refer to a document that talks about uh literature review and uh, the factors of failure 
there are some factors that we um, can influence the others that we cannot influence. It's like playing poker, you have, you know, your cards and then you can change one or two, but not the full deck. This is also a question that, that I get uh, frequently. Can scoliosis get better with bracing? Well, because we don't have literature that supports uh, long, uh, long uh, studies with the big number of patients, what I'm going to refer to is uh, case presentations. All right, with all this uh, amount of information, let's uh, get started with the first uh, question, which is what happened if I don't raise my kids? You know, we just decided not to do anything. So Dr. Uh, Weinstein did an amazing uh, uh, job and you had an interview with him where he describes this uh, two studies. The first one, which is the natural history of uh, scoliosis, is a work that he um, did when he moved, he started when he moved to Iowa. And uh, at that time, there was no treatment, uh, either surgical or uh, bracing. So the, he found that there were files of patients that uh, were coming back, but were not being treated. And that was a good opportunity to follow them. So he followed them basically for a lifetime. Um, he took only patients with um, um, adolescent uh, idiopathic scoliosis, while before there were studies that were done with um, uh, scoliosis, either congenital, neurological, idiopathic, and then those results could, uh, those studies with this group could give a different result. So he found that there is no evidence or even more pain or a, a functional deficiency if we if he compare adults with the scoliosis, uh, idiopathic scoliosis versus no scoliosis. Meaning, what will happen with your with your child? Well, let me tell you a personal story. I do this full time and I treat only scoliosis. And um, my uh, my daughter lives with her mom in a different state. And um, at some point during COVID, she was taken to the hospital and they found that she didn't have pneumonia, but she had scoliosis. Um, the, the interesting thing is that uh, um, she chose not to have a brace and she was mature enough that uh, at age 13 and a half, almost 14, uh, we decided to just let it go. Why? Because nothing, is going to happen really with uh, with with her in the future. She may uh, later on uh, think, oh well, I should have done something about it, but nothing fundamental is going to happen with her. Um, he started, Dr. Weinstein started to study retrospectively and then continue following them after a while. The patients with untreated um, adolescent hepatitis scoliosis were able to be successful. Um, rich, um, have families, have kids, do absolutely everything, uh, being uh, active in uh, sports and all type of adult uh, activity. The only thing is when they were interviewed, they say, we wish we had an option when we were kids. We wish we had a choice. We wish we could do something about, you know, the way my body looks, the asymmetry of my body. Um, for some cases that were really drastic, you know, probably they had some difficulty with, um, uh, uh, you know, the breathing capacity or so, but not to change functionally their daily activity. But yet, they, they, they would love to have the opportunity that our kids have today. So if you're listening to this as a parent, um, there is the information. Something could be done, absolutely, and we are in the best time uh, in history to address this issue. Normally what happens is uh, kids with uh, scoliosis, we talk about skeletal maturity, either with the uh, research one to five or with Sanders. And let's say we have a kid like, you know, I mentioned my daughter that uh, she was between 30 uh, and, and 40 degrees. And this is the percentage or the possibility of having surgery. Now surgery is considered um, that is needed when a patient has 50 degrees or or more. So my my daughter basically was, you know, not even here, it was 
up in the scale with, with a really low possibility of having surgery. So in that respect, we were fine. But now if we have a kid that is, is younger, and even if he has a small curve, there is a bigger possibility of ended up having surgery. That is with respect of what would happen if the curve progress and how far it's going to progress. Now, the next question of does bracing work? Well, uh, Dr. Weinstein and Lori uh, Dolan also, they um, address this question with this document, the effect of bracing in adolescents with idiopathic scoliosis. And they answered the question, is bracing effective in grown children and adolescents with uh, curves between 20 and 40 degrees? <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's interesting, you know, the at that time, I think the Scoliosis Research Society was talking about treating kids that are 25 or above on the cup angle. Uh, this study took patients uh, 20 degrees. So they did this work with um, different centers, a multi-center study. Um, they um, um, were uh, collecting the sample, the, the patients coming to the study, and they consider a success by the end of their uh, uh, skeletal maturity if the patient was 50 degrees or less, and, and failure if the patient had a co-angle of 50 degrees or more, or the, they had surgery. Now, the variable that they had for the study was either the kid had a brace or the kid didn't have a brace. It's important to know that uh, the, uh, the study has a, a, had the intention of assess if the way kids were treated currently back then, uh, you know, more than 10 years ago, um, with the braces the institutions were using at that time, so there was mostly Boston Braves, Wilmington, and others. Um, now it's interesting that uh, Boston, when we say Boston Braves, it's not that the company uh, is making the braces. Um, people can make braces and call it a Boston Braves and, and doesn't have a direct um, supervision of uh, a Boston Braves company. And the other group was just observation. So basically you will take your child to one of these centers and then they'll ask you, do you want to be part of it? And uh, they will select randomly if you, your kid will have a brace or not. It was okay for a while, but you know, it didn't sit well for some people saying, you know, I don't want that to be randomized. And at some point it was difficult to get more, more kids to the study. So they went from the uh, randomized to being an elective. You will get the kid to the study, but then you get to choose if the kid will have or will not have the brace. The study then had more uh, samples, and uh, what they noticed is that it was evident that kids that were only an observation had a small possibility of avoiding surgery, meaning they had a, a, you know more than fifty uh, percent chance of ending in surgery, versus kids with braces that had a really small possibility of ending up in surgery or a big possibility of avoiding surgery. That's one of the wonderful findings of that study. Um, the second one is this that I think is not, um, doesn't pay, people don't pay that close attention to this as it should be. Uh, for one, I, uh, I contact uh, Lori and I ask um, a little bit about this chart because uh, when people see, you know, this specific, when we have here, for instance, between zero and six hours, you know, down here we have the hours that the kid wears the brace during the day. This line represents all this segment of a population. I don't know really exactly how many kids, you know, 40 or so, that uh, is not that if you wear the brace, um, six hours specifically, your kid is going to have that percentage. It's just landed in this territory, in this area. When people read this chart, they say, okay, well, according to this chart, if I have my kid 13 hours in the brace, then I'm going to have like almost 90% of possibility of avoiding surgery. But not really, because this chart starts, 
you know, from, from the 12 hours where you have, you know, a little bit less possibility. And depending on the uh, risk of progression, skeletal maturity, you could be in, in, in all this area. Yes, you're saying basically that if it's uh, if you prescribe like uh, 12 to 18 hours, then if it's 12, it could be as low as 70% uh, success rate. If it's 18, it's 90%. So there's a variability between that range. Exactly. So the what we recommend normally is like uh, 20 hours and uh, it has... Uh, it has a clear intention and one thing is to you know get things going in such a way that we're going to have the bigger the biggest amount of success as soon as possible also to include the time when the kid goes to school and um, uh, that way uh, we guarantee that the kid is going to be around you know the 18 hours let's say uh, we say 20 and they go to uh, 18 17 hours we still are in a good range Versus if we say, you know, uh, 18, well, no, for, for the school, out of school, it would be like 14 hours. They end up with 12, uh, 10 hours. So then we decrease the rate to uh, 70, 60%. If we explain this in a different way, let's say there is one kid uh, with Sanders one or two and has 30 degrees of cup angle in a, in, in a curve. And then he started wearing the brace 18 hours doing a great job, has about 80% of possibility of being successful, meaning avoiding surgery. But then after six months, it discovered like, ah, I, I just kind of want to take a little bit of a break, goes down to 12 hours, decrease to 60%. If it goes down to six hours, 26% of possibility of being successful. This six hours is almost like the percentage of people that were on an observation. This is about the amount of time and the importance of that amount of time. How about the embrace correction? So Lori did a presentation where uh, she um, talked about the review of uh, like 40% of the braces that were used during the study. And she found that the majority of the braces did not achieve 50% of correction. So when the, the doctor said, you know, we wish, you know, like we prescribe this brace and we expect 50% of correction. Well, it's not really what is happening normally. And it depends on so many variables that for some kid, 50% is totally uh, achievable and even more, but for some other kids, it's okay if you have 30 or 40%. Then uh, they discovered that for that study with the group that participated, the average uh, between Canada and the US was 33%. So being between the 33%, 50% around that area is, is, is uh, the standard of correction. A again, let's emphasize the amount of correction, which we have on, on the left side right here, versus the amount of time we're in the brace. Let's say that I, uh, I make a brace and I have a 10% of correction. I made a bucket, you know, and that is barely, you know, doing some correction. But the kid is wearing the brace a lot. Still, it has a good possibility of avoiding uh, surgery versus having a really great correction, like 50%, but not wearing the brace, but only six hours. So even though the amount of correction in brace is important, it's more important the participation that the families will have or the patient will have, meaning how many hours you are in the treatment. So if the average is 33% um, uh, national-wide, but then you're using the brace only uh, six hours, you have uh, like 23, 25% of possibility of avoiding surgery. Again, all this is a statistics. It's not about your kid. It's about a group of people, uh, but it's... Is not an individualized uh, number. What the tendency is then, the more hours, the more possibility for the three groups, uh, small correction, mid correction, and high correction. The amount of time that you wear the brace is more relevant than the type of brace. Now, that leads me to, okay, this is kind of uh, in your hands. And that's what I tell the, to my patients. Like, I just make the brace. Your parents just drove you here and then, you know, 
they pay for some expenses, but uh, you as a kid, you are the one in charge of that. And not only that, I just thought that you, you as an uh, adult will be so thankful for what you're doing right now. And I think they, they find it fascinating that uh, they can affect their lives in, in such a way. There is a story that I tell to uh, therapists and friends the way I see things, you know, three types of families that I see or the three types of patients that I see. Um, this was out of a story that I was telling a group of therapists that were being uh, trained to become a PSSC uh, therapist. And I describe it this way. I see three groups. The first one is like, no, thank you. We're okay. Um, the second one is they find an expert and they will follow the expert. The problem with this is that if the expert was wrong, then they would blame the expert. And we will clarify this in a second. And then the last one is what I call the spoon vendors. So the first group, no, thank you, we're okay. That came from a story of uh, when I finished my my training, uh, the first training, the first uh, um, Stroth uh, PSSC training with uh, Barcelona um, School of Physical Therapy here in the States. And um, my best friend, uh, one of my best friends, his daughter has scoliosis in, in Florida. And then I told him, listen, I, uh, I make braces. I can give you the brace for free. Uh, I am also able to show you some exercises. I will not charge you. So he just looked at uh, his daughter and said, honey, do you want to do exercises? And she was on the phone, you know, clicking. She looked at that and said, nah. So do you want a brace? Like, no, Dad, thank you. And then he looked at his wife and said, do you notice anything? She doesn't have pain. It's like, no, I don't. So no, thank you. We're okay. To that group, you know, like, I don't see anything or I cannot do anything. I'm overwhelmed. I don't know how to do it. You know, I have all these complications or the group of people that they have paralysis and they don't know what to do. It's better not to try to convert them into anything else. Leave them uh, alone because um, they are not ready. You know, things will be uh, okay, but don't don't try to convert them into a, a different group. The next one is the followers. They take action, but they take action following, let's say, uh, uh, expert massage therapist, a chiropractor someone that promised them or tells them or sells them the idea that they're going to take care of uh, the scoliosis. And, um, you know, uh, it's uh, interesting, but we can also see people following the guru, either, um, you know, the one that will do chanting, the one that will do, uh, you know, praying or tobacco and, or, or smoking or whatever it is the case. And I mentioned this because, it, it, it happens, you know, like if my ancestors, I'm from Colombia, from Bogota, and uh, if my ancestors would take a left instead of right at some point, I could end up in a system uh, where probably in, in, in the mountains of Colombia, uh, believing in, in the guru uh, as a source of healing for me. So I need to know my audience. I need to know who I'm talking to. Um, most of our clients find um, a good doctor in the healthcare system, <clears throat> and then they follow what the doctor says, but then they follow blindly. And if things go wrong, then they will follow either one of them. They will blame either one of them. The next group is the um, spoon vendors. They read articles. I have a, a family, uh, this lady, when she if she gets to see this, she's going to know who, who she is. She came with a plastic bag full of uh, papers, and she will ask me questions. And then when I answer, she will say yes because, and she will find an article and show me yes, yeah, you're right. And then test me constantly, you know, with each question that she knew the answer. Those are the kind of you know spoon vendors to the extreme. Um, they watch videos like this. Direct most of your audience. They are spoon vendors. They're people that are looking for information beyond what the doctor said or the expert. Um, they reach uh, communities, not only communities like uh, Facebook or you know a wonderful group that you have, but uh, communities like church, communities like uh, family or neighbors. And they tell everybody 
the story looking for solutions. They ask questions and another thing that is important, they tell the doctor what's their preference. So I'm gonna uh, take uh, two or three minutes just to show you um, what a spoon bender uh, looks like, a family of spoon benders. Actually, uh, I recorded this video yesterday uh, thinking about this presentation and I asked this family if it was okay to, uh, to uh, uh, present it here. So uh, we just finished the process. Uh, you guys came yesterday. We uh, did the evaluation, uh, make the braids. You participated in making the braids. So you guys played ping pong and had a lot of fun, a lot of hot chocolate here. And um, today we delivered the braids, x-rays and everything. But because this is um, information that we want to want to give to new families, I want you guys to um, tell us um, how do you find that she has scoliosis and then how do you find us? How do you find what to do? So she went for her uh, uh, annual physical and the primary care physician there noticed, had her bend over and did a screening and noticed um, a bend in her spine and uh, recommended us to go to get x-rays and we could get um, better view of it. Uh, we went a few days later and we got x-rays taken and then sent back to uh, her and then she re uh, referred us to an orthopedist in our area and um, he looked at the x-rays and we met with him and um, he kind of said her, she was at 14 degrees and it wasn't uh, we were kind of at a wait and see she didn't want to do bracing yet um, but in the meantime, we kind of looked up uh, different Facebook groups and, and found the Shro therapy instead of, it was a more active approach than just the wait and see. So we found somebody in our area, um, Rachel Clay, who does uh, the therapy. And um, we met with her and we started our physical therapy routine. And then um, we continued with that until it was time to go back for follow-up x-rays um, earlier this month. And we had progressed into bracing territory um, and so we went back and saw um, Rachel and she, when we they wanted us to to start with the Boston and with some of the research that we had done we had really know we wanted the, the Rego brace um, type braces and uh, we got referred to Walter here um, at the National Scoliosis Center and did some more research in different groups and uh, had amazing reviews and uh, it looked uh, like a place we wanted to be. So we flew out here uh, from St. Louis mainly to get her in her first brace as, uh, as soon as we could. And uh, we thought it was better to come out here and get it done to have the x-rays and he can do all the adjustments here. And I feel like it worked out really well for us. Good and tell me your experience it was very good i love it here and my favorite part was getting to make my brace which i love doing that and picking out like what pattern it was very fun yes, and tell me what is this <laughs> i got to use the extra plastic from my brace to make a bowl and a unicorn horn for my little sister and a wand for me wonderful <laughs> <laughs> thank you to the three of you. Thank you for being here, for trusting us. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So if you heard in the conversation, the narrative that he had, he said, you know, he went and he read and he looked for information. And uh, by the time they uh, did the second x-ray and they noticed that she increased from 14 to uh, almost 30 degrees in a short period of time, they were ready. They already had plenty of information ready for action. This patient is a patient of uh, uh, in St. Louis of uh, Rachel uh, Clay from uh, Clay Scoliosis Clinic. And on Fridays, actually, uh, you know, uh, around uh, 10 a.m., we have a group of therapists and we talk about cases. So it's not that this patient is gone and out of the picture. The therapist constantly just giving us feedback. I'm showing them, you know, the cases and what uh, uh, the results are. Another benefit is that, you know, as you know, Derek, there is an EOS machine at uh, National Scoliosis Center, and it saves a lot of time. 
because normally a patient is coming to uh, to um, uh, our clinic and 24 hours later they have results and they have an adjustment of the brace based on the x-ray and they go home knowing what happened but or, or they already have um, if they will stay in St. Louis or in Florida or whatever other territory that I go to, then they need to wait for me to go. Then uh, a month later, I will deliver the brace. Then a month later, they will have the x-ray for three months. Then the doctor will review that. And then I need to make adjustments. Between three or four months versus 24 hours. And three or four months for someone that's grown is significant. So it's a model that uh, was um, created by uh, Luke uh, Skyclader that you know, is, uh, is a wonderful. Now, the goal is interesting because the, the doctors will have, you know, five, 10 minutes to do assessment, notes, review x-rays, talk to the family, answer questions, and take a plan of action when uh, they see a kid with scoliosis. And normally the goal is, okay, we need to prevent surgery. Let me tell you what's the best way to do that. And they prescribe a brace, depending on, you know, their experience, the school, or uh, um, the environment that the, they train on, uh, they will prescribe one brace or another. Now, the literature also talks about a, a higher level of uh, goal, which is prevent progression of the curve, meaning the cup angle will stay the same at the end of the skeletal maturity. Let's say we have a kid with 30 degrees and is 12 years old, we uh, consider that a success when she finished uh, skeletal maturity, Sanders uh, eight over eight, and she's still at 30, 33, 35 degrees. That is a higher goal. The one before, uh, let's say we have the same kid with 30 uh, degrees and they end up with 40, 45 degrees. They didn't have surgery that's considered a success, but yet the curve uh, uh, got worse. So those are two differences of goals, but there is another one. There is one that the literature doesn't describe is decreasing the cup angles. Now, doctors are careful not to say that this is possible because there is no uh, study that will uh, prove that this is possible. Yet uh, in a conversation that we had with one local doctor uh, at the last SRS uh, meeting, uh, he was saying is undeniable. Uh, we have, uh, I have patients in my practice that uh, they come, uh, they wear your brace, they know that brace style, and then uh, by the end of their growth, they have a smaller uh, cup angle. And it's not one or two or three. That would be an anecdotal uh, situation. Um, it has a, con a level of consistency. So we don't have uh, anecdotal evidence, we have a hypothesis to be studied. The point is, which goal would you choose? Like, and it's totally okay if you are in that uh, in, in that place where um, I had a patient, for instance, like, you know, I'm too busy, my goal is to become an athlete, I'm training for this, and I, you know, I just want to do the minimum, I don't want surgery. The kid that says, you know, I don't want surgery, and I'm training to uh, become uh, a pilot and you know those are perfectly understandable goals um and based on natural history it's it, it doesn't really matter but for some healthcare practitioners uh, physical therapists for parents and later on for even the patients some of them they will choose decreasing the the cup angle so the treatment is different all right what's the difference between braces this is something that uh, uh i am going to uh, talk in uh, generic terms mm, because it's not really the, the purpose of this conversation to be specific about uh, uh, type of braces. But I'm going to call the traditional school of braces, uh, braces like the Milwaukee and Wilmington, Boston, and even the Rosenberger, and then the well known and famous Walter Ramos brace. Uh, when I was doing uh, braces in Chicago before knowing uh, Dr. Rigo. Uh, you know, it was just the way I was making braces. It was a mix of one thing or another. Not famous at all. I'm just uh, joking with that. And then also the uh, nighttime braces. They are all kind of in, in one group. And I talk about the European school, uh, even though there are some other braces uh, like Lyon and uh, 
other bridges that I don't know specifics about. Uh, I also know that um, not all of them are um, symmetrical in shape, but um, clearly the asymmetry, the 3D component, uh, what started by Dr. Cheneau, followed by Dr. Rigo and the 90s. And today, the way it has been taught, the way it has been presented, uh, is now known as the Regal concept. RC is a Regal concept 3D. So back in Colombia, and then uh, when I went to Northwestern University, uh, I learned that um, it, the brace needed to be a, a map in such a way that I will have a, an outcome based on the X-ray. So a traditional school will, uh, uh, you know, this is the the type of brace that is symmetrical in shape and it has a posterior opening with some straps. And the uh, uh, Rigo Chanel is anterior opening, doesn't have the straps on the back, but in the front. Um, that in itself has a benefit with the tension of the brace when kids are putting the brace on uh, their own. Um, the the shape is uh, absolutely different, and one of the differences is not only the the height and the upper block, but also the areas of expansion versus windows. Um, we'll talk about that later. Let's review a little bit of history of uh, where the the Regal Chanel came from, so it's easy to understand the mechanics of that. So uh, a century ago, when in 1920, there was a lady, Katharina Schroth, and she um, had scoliosis. She was actually working a, in an office doing a cler clerical job, and uh, but she started noticing her back and how she could uh, reposition her um, um, spine in such a way that she will see that will be more symmetrical. Then she started treating patients, and this is one of the examples of a patient that she uh, treated. So... This is absolutely evidence, but look at the front uh, right here, how we're collapsed. And then little by little, she will teach her and also manipulate the patient to uh, create uh, a counter or an opposite position to the one that the scoliosis would bring that body to. This is the final um, outcome, but this is for the picture is uh, uh, literally unsustainable for the patient to stay there, but she was able to to hold that posture, and this without braces, without uh, um, uh, surgery, just uh, hands on. These patients used to work four or five hours a day for almost three months, and usually they will have two people working with them. Totally different than the uh, PSCC recommended today. So we cannot expect you know results like this when when uh, we are doing just a little. There is no. Um, institution like this was back then in Germany, where they had kids that will stay there for uh, for months. The type of curves that the, uh, she was seeing uh, were curves that were absolutely uh, bigger compared to what we see today. This will be a surgical level uh, uh, today, but back then the option was uh, this sort of exercises. Here is a picture of uh, Katrina, and um, you see her. Uh, clients or students, she was not a physical therapist, uh, Katarina, because there was no physical therapy school back then. She became a gymnastic um, trainer, so she was able to work with patients hands-on. Look at the trunk, uh, the size of the trunk compared to, uh, you know, Katarina in the back. You know, this hand right here shows the pelvic translation and... Um, uh, those are severe, cur severe curves. Now, look at the position, and we're talking about bracing, so look at the position and try to think about, you know, what a brace will do. <clears throat> so there is a system of pulleys right here that is elongating the patient. There is a system of contacts that is trying to derotate by segments, and we will see that later. Her knee is doing a specific job right there. So um, uh, Krista, is, uh, the daughter of Katrina right here, is busy handling with a patient that probably already had some level of uh, experience um, with the training. Now, uh, the next picture, this is uh, Adalbert, the husband of uh, uh, Krista, and look at the uh, piece of wood right here. 
uh, with the cushion and trying to control the pelvis. Look, not at his right hand, but the left hand right here, how he's bringing uh, the uh, middle section of the trunk, which we call the, you know, the thoracic block, and try to derotate that section while the upper section has been uh, controlled and uh, managed by uh, the other practitioner. Then uh, they used to have uh, uh, groups of uh, patients where, you know, some of them that were already trained, um, look at this patient here, look at her pelvis that is moving absolutely to the right while she's elongating and opening the uh, um, left thoracic side. The same thing, you know, with patients that already had some experience, but they need some assistance. And um, uh, that's what they were doing back there. But again, hours and hours of work for several days. So that happened and it, it was a century ago, it was in Germany. And I decided to put this map to have a perspective of what has happened and all the time that has been taken to travel this information from one side to another. So it started in uh, the eastern, uh, east part of Germany in the 20s, then uh, um, Krista moved to, uh, and I think uh, Katarina, they moved to the west part of uh, Germany. And uh, it was in the 40s and around the uh, 60s or 70s, then uh, Dr. Cheneau was having the influence of uh, doctors doing casting for scoliosis and how they were derotating. But he also knew uh, what uh, uh, Krista and Catherine were doing in East Germany, so he was in contact with them, and he adapted a system of braces uh, that he started teaching in the uh, late 80s. Um, and uh, around the late 80s and 90s, Dr. Rigo in Barcelona uh, he ended up working uh, with the scoliosis. You interview him also. It's a beautiful interview to listen, you know, how he got involved in scoliosis. And he started seeing that um, the braces that he was getting were not consistent with the type of curve that he was seeing on the patients. So under the name of Chenot, there were a lot of braces with different shapes, but people didn't have either the knowledge or the experience to do the right brace. That's why he was, in a way, motivated or forced to uh, get into bracing and try to answer his own questions of what's what's going on here or how we could teach this better. Um, it took 70 years to go from one place to another and it has been taken under 30 years to come from Europe to the States. We have uh, the a list of uh, traditional um, things that are done with the TLSO and the European. So let's let's start with the first one, which is how do you start treating the patient when you have a traditional uh, TLSO? And what you need to do is a, a blueprint. So you get the X-ray and you take the, uh, the lumbar section, the width of the, the, the lumbar, and then start drawing uh, the blueprint on the x-ray. So I'm treating the x-ray. I'm not treating the patient. I'm just looking at uh, the x-ray. And remember, the x-ray is a moment in time. But it could happen that the kid move, that uh, he move a leg, that uh, he got tired, that whatever happened, and this doesn't reflect always the truth. <clears throat> So then you start doing the draw the drawing. One thing also interesting is that uh, the the brace goes up to the apex of the curve, and then you follow the ribs, and right there is where the brace is supposed to end, which in itself uh, creates some difficulties. <clears throat> Excuse me, and. Um, that's a, 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 one of the uh, important difference to to consider. Although uh, things have uh, changed now and things are doing a little bit different, but this will be the final product where you you know draw the pads, the pad for the lumbar, the pad for the thoracic, on a almost symmetrical shape, and then a window for 
the body to um, to move uh, from one side to the other. That is the blueprint, and usually you make the brace or you order it, you know, somewhere. On the uh, Rigo Chenot or the European school, you start with the clinical presentation, and then you correlate that with the X-ray. Basically, you don't see the X-ray. You don't take a look at the X-ray until you see the patient and you do an assessment of the patient. So we look at uh, this guy and there is a, a laser uh, vertical line right there. Um, I can see a rotation of the trunk. I can see also the translation of some segments of the trunk. Um, I can see that uh, on, on this picture, I was telling him how to um, uh, correct the uh, decompensation that he uh, that he had because if I look at here, he's standing uh, in such a way that the pelvis is going to the left and the trunk is going to the right. So it's like a little bit um, an an inclination, and uh, actually we can see it here clearly. If you see the shoes and then you see the mirror of the pelvis, it's like the pelvis is going a little bit to the left and then the upper is going to the right. Um, this is after he uh, he was instructed and see if he could correct that for him to feel it. And it's interesting because that felt weird for him. I tell my patients, I say, can you hear my accent? And all of them say, yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, like not knowing where I'm going with this story. And then I say, well, I cannot hear my accent. I live with myself all the time. When I woke up, there I am. And uh, uh, the same thing is with posture and scoliosis. You know what you know, you stand the way you stand, the posture is the way it is, and you consider that normal. So for him to do this correction, it was a challenge. Now, uh, also I do the uh, Adam's test and then uh, checking on um, the scoliometer to see the amount of rotation. Again, without looking at, at the X-ray, so I have map, um, almost like a blueprint, but on the body of the patient. When I can see the amount of rotation, I can see where that rotation is happening, and then um, how long that rotation extends. So I have a, a good picture of what's going on. Now, um, by the way, this... Uh, um, Adam says can be done standing or it could be done in a sitting. Dr. Rigo teaches that to do it in a sitting position. Now we have, if I look only at the x-ray, I see that his head is uh, going to the left of this vertical line. So he's decompensated to the left. But when we look at the, uh, his clinical, it's just the opposite. And the clinical has been consistent you know, along the, the, the visit. Um, and uh, then what do I get to trust? I get to trust more uh, the clinical than the x-ray. Everything else seems you know, consistent, including the rotation. One thing also that I get to check is, if I look at the x-ray, this iliac uh, crest is wider than, than the opposite. So on the left side, that tells me that uh, the pelvis is derotated to uh, the left, but when I look at uh, here, I don't notice it that much. And this could affect how much rotation I can see in, in, on, on the lumbar. So of course that requires you know, some experience, uh, some guidance. Uh, I think the fact that I, uh, I have the dual uh, discipline of physical therapy, that I was able to do uh, the training with uh, the Barcelona School, um, and PSSC helps me tremendously to see those things. But um, I, you know, one of my my partners, uh, Christian Christensen, and also look uh, uh, Skyclader, they they are as sharp with those things. This is the original classification of uh, 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 Shroud, and she did something like this. She divided in blocks and uh, either three blocks or four blocks. The difference between the, the three or four was on the lumbosacral the pelvis. And uh, then uh, Dr. Rigo, one of his uh, big uh, uh, contributions to the treatment of conservative uh, 
treatment of scoliosis with braces is that he uh, had a classification that was related to what type of brace to use. So the classification was developed in order to define um, specific uh, principles of corrections required for a specific uh, type of uh, bracing uh, of curves. So here it is. Let's say we have the a patient with a 3C type of curve. So for that, I have three possibilities. So it's not a real brace is for an, everybody and anybody. There are different type of braces that need to be designed specifically, specifically for a case. So I could have a type A1, A2, or A3, depending on the clinical and also depending on the radiological finding. Based on that, then I will have a brace that is slightly different to the other. The same thing happened with uh, the uh, 4C type of curve. In that case, we have two options. But when I see a, a B1 or a B2, still, let's say a B2, uh, I need to know the extent of each block. We will illustrate that later. And the same thing happened with uh, uh, the type of brace design according to the classification. And also it repeats with the a group called non trigon 4 and the group called uh, thoracolumbar and lumbar, single uh, lumbar curve. So this is the case of this patient and uh, we uh, made a the brace for him and uh, we see uh, here out of brace and then here I think it was minus two degrees so he got some correction there. Um, this was uh, six months later although this kid is already 15 he was 15 now he's 16. Uh, the 30 degree curve became an 18 degree curve because he wears the, the brace consistently. Another characteristic of, of the European style or the Rico brace is that there is some asymmetry by segments. So when we talk about segments, uh, the best way to illustrate that is just think about me doing a cut on the brace right here. And then if I move it and try to look at like look at inside the pocket, the right side has a different shape than the left one. And then the same thing happened at, at this uh, lumbar level. If you see there is a narrow section here, there is a more like a wider section on the other side. That is to take that block and just uh, create that rotation. The same thing happened here even with the trim line. The trim line is allowing one side to uh, be free while the other one is contained having a good control starting from uh, the pelvis all the way up. The same way with this elevated section, all of, of these components around the brace um, are designed specifically for the patient. Uh, so the front, the back, the side, we can think about those sections on the transverse plane, known the coronal, the coronal is is, um, is a given, but it's the transfer plane that is the one that becomes really interesting. Now, the, one of the most effective uh, effective three point pressure systems, I think, is is um, achieved with this type of brace. And I say that because if you uh, uh, remember the first uh, one of the first pictures, um, this patient in the center, when I saw this uh, patient. She had uh, this brace for like a month, month and a half, but the embrace correction wasn't good. And this is one of the reasons the upper block, the upper section was off, was outside the brace. This is an example of uh, another patient that will present later, you know, how the upper section is off. This contact should be a little bit higher. You know, this should be all the way up here. There is a reason why this happened on this brace. Uh, I will talk about that uh, in a while. So here we see that uh, on a conventional type of brace, there is no area of expansion. And also what well, we're talking about right now, the three-point uh, pressure system. 
So to have this counterforce up here is almost unexistent. So this is an illustration. That, you know, if I'm going to apply this force here for this the curve on the thoracic section, I need two counterforces, and the longer um, the distance between one point and the other, the longer the lever arm to have a better correction. And it's like if I move this green pad, you know, down here a couple of you know inches or so, then the the impact is not going to be the same. Areas of expansion. That's another uh, contribution. We already saw areas of expansion, but let me give you an example of a brace that is not um, giving enough areas of expansion to the patient. Um, this brace was uh, made uh, again for the patient because when I was asking her to expand, the brace itself was a limitation. And that's uh, evidence right there. <clears throat> it's important to know that this brace was already designed for the patient, but no, not with uh, the um, you know the characteristics that we needed for her specifically. Right there. So let's see because uh, I think here there we go. The same thing happened with this brace that uh, she's trying to expand and you know her body is coming out, but <clears throat> I need more expansion on the side, more extension, expansion posteriorly where she is free to move. Um, let's uh, look at this one. Here, all the way there is no contact so she can expand and all the way in the back there is no contact either. So when she breathes in, the expansion goes on the back. Derek, how are we doing? We're doing good. We're doing good. Okay, good. We're doing a lot. <laughs> okay, good. <clears throat> so, derotations by blocks. We already talked about a block system, about the contribution of uh, Dr. Rigo um, on the classification, but I did a small video also um, of a, some uh, wood blocks that were done by David at National Scholastic Center and for us to illustrate this. So here it is. This is a representation of the spine and the trunk uh, by blocks, according to what um, Katharina Schrod and her daughter described uh, initially, and then and expanded uh, as this classification by Dr. Rigo. Just as an example, we're going to see what happened um, and the transverse plane, so I need to incline this a little bit, but you know what happened is there is a rotation. Look what happened on the upper block. I'm not touching it, but uh, see what happened with the upper block. You know, there is a rotation on the lower mid and, uh, and upper block. Surgeons will not do surgery with scoliosis without derotating, and something that we need to do also is we need to derotate the uh, the spine and then bring it back to a corrected posture. So do I push from the pelvis? Do I push from the trunk? Depending on the classification is the action that I need to take. That's why it's important to follow classification, the sign of the brace and have a mentor. Yes. Yeah, so that part of have a mentor is is a, it's really important. When I was uh, working on my own in uh, in Florida, I thought you know this is this is really good. You know I can call the shots, I can do everything. But um, and I also had at that point access to people in the uh, in Spain and Barcelona and some other places in, in Russia even to ask some people um, in Turkey. But um, uh, when I uh, talked to Luke and we decided to work together in Fairfax and National Scoliosis Center, one of the attractions was uh, the center itself, but also the fact that uh, Luke is such a good mentor also. He has a lot of experience uh, at different settings. So think again, 
um, about the area of expansion where we're derotating, you know, and we have the block uh, move from one side to the other. But if the brace is not allowing the spine to derotate, we're not going to have that effect. That's why it's so important this uh, system of, uh, of blocks and this classification. Now, pelvic uh, correction. When uh, a PSSC, uh, the physiotherapy specific scoliosis uh, exercises, talk about uh, pelvic correction, there are five different pelvic corrections. Most of them can be achieved also in the brace. For this illustration, we're going to talk only about the coronal plane, but think that this brace uh, always takes into consideration the transverse plane, transverse plane. So the first block is going to be in the pelvis. So we can take a look at the pelvis right there. We uh, uh, also know by clinical evidence where the pelvis is rotated in relationship to the thoracal lumbar section. <clears throat> so there is the first block right there. And if you look at this line right here, you can see you know, there is a, almost like a diagram of how extended this rotation is, you know, less rotation here, less here, but this is the deepest of, of, of that uh, rotation of that section. So when I have my next block there, if I don't have enough experience, I could make only a small block or a small amount of rotation, leaving everything else out of the, um, the correction instead of having a wider uh, section to derotate and control. The same thing happened with the upper upper blocks. So which one is uh, you know moving the left or right, derotated in all three planes. So this is what we will design that in the brace, and not only on the coronal but also on the other two planes. So it will be represented then in uh, what we see in the patient right there. So think about the blocks right now, and then you will have an idea. Think about the pelvic translation only uh, on the coronal plane, but also uh, pelvic um, uh, tilt, and then uh, you know uh, elevation one side or the other, etc. Uh, we we also um, pay attention to the sagittal profile. There are patients that standing could lean forward or the opposite, they just lean back and uh, paying uh, close attention to that profile is important. Okay. I think I have uh, this, um, this slide of what's, um, you know, looping. So it's not about the brace, really. You can choose a Regal, Boston, whatever the name, conventional, traditional, European, but if the practitioner doesn't have the level of competency, then um, things are not really in a good place. Um, <clears throat> the same happened for you know the doctor that you choose versus the, the guru, the chiropractor, the expert that uh, you think has enough experience. But what is uh, competency? Um, and this is a definition that we share with uh, um, with Luke and Christian, my two partners at, at the office. You know, it's a practitioner that's supposed to have enough skills. You know, they had formal training. They went to medical school. They went to physical therapy school. They went to the orthotic and prosthetic school. And they have some basic skills. For instance, we have a group of chiropractors that are selling braces, but they don't know how to, you know, do a modification, do an assessment, make a brace. Uh, they're just selling them. Um, take them, you know, have the knowledge, either of one, a traditional or the a regal concept. It doesn't really matter. The, the idea is that the practitioner has enough experience in what they are doing, have the knowledge and the skills. So the experience usually comes with a mentorship, usually comes with somebody that is teaching you the, the ropes. Mm. 
the problem that we have at this at this point with uh, um, the Rigo type of braces is that we don't have a school that can teach this. We don't have practitioners that are um, really competent. Yet there's a lot of people that are saying, well, I, I uh, provide the Chanel because somebody's making it and sending it to me. Um, I order it uh, through measurements or through pictures, but um, they don't have the competency. So at that point is irrelevant, really, the, the brace. Luke, um, he is a proponent of having an orthotist with a specialization, like a fellowship in scoliosis and only scoliosis. Why? Because the same way that doctors, you know, when we go and see a doctor, we don't get a generalist. We don't get a doctor that, uh, you know, is doing uh, different things, including uh, scoliosis, or even within the orthopedic community, uh, we don't get someone that is doing trauma, lower extremities, upper extremities, fractures, and then adults and kids. No, usually we get a pediatrician. Uh, you know, to predict that, it, you know, specialized in kids and it does a fellowship in scoliosis and does surgery mostly on kids. So with um, orthotics, we also have people that are doing braces or doing inserts, they're doing uh, prosthetics, they're doing different things. So if they have one or two patients a week, they feel like they have a lot of experience. The specialist normally has, you know, doctors that have clinics for only for scoliosis once or twice a week uh, and the same thing with uh, the orthotic community um, at our uh, center we don't make an alpha we don't make a brace for lower extremity or for hands we only make braces for um, young kids or adolescents um, with scoliosis uh, but it's about where the the um, market should move to. This is um, <laughs> like seven years ago or so, uh, the first time I went to visit Dr. Rigo. Um, he, this is not his office, this is a shop, an orthotic shop near his office, but he goes to modify there. And this was the second brace that he was modifying that day. After uh, seeing patients in the morning, then he will go uh, for a, a lunch and then go back to the office to see a patient. And I had the opportunity to uh, share some time with with him. And every year, actually, I spend some time with uh, with him, either there in Barcelona or uh, like this year, he came to National Scoliosis Center. And we he was here for a week teaching us, refreshing more information. Um. We make our own braces. You know, I work with uh, four, five more practitioners, and uh, we don't leave the part of the fabrication for uh, for somebody else. We do the evaluation. We do the computer work, the design after you know doing the classification, and then uh, once we're done, this is actually the same patient that I presented. Uh, one of the patients that I presented today. And uh, we finish the, the the product. The only thing is we give the pulling of the plastic to a, a group of people, and we get the patient involved in that in that section when they want to. Um, the fabrication of of this is absolutely you know individualized for that particular patient. Now this is uh, Luke, uh, mentor partner and the creator of National Scoliosis Center. And on the other side is Christian. Uh, we are all in a different stage of the process of uh, fabrication of the brace. Uh, usually this happens early in the morning, like 7 a.m. We're, we're busy trying to finish work. Let's uh, talk about uh, case presentations. I cannot talk about um, a study that will show that uh, the curves can get better, but the only thing that I get to uh, to do right now is to have the anecdotal uh, cases here and there, or some that fail for whatever reason. So the first case, <clears throat> uh, female, uh, almost 13 and a half, I saw her in January of this year, um, 
adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, it was prescribed a regal brace. It was Sanders IV, uh, it was one month post uh, menarche and no other medical condition. She had like 40 degrees, uh, decompensated uh, to the left, pelvic translation, uh, not that much rotation of the pelvis uh, uh, and the x-ray. This is the x-ray, although I already mentioned that the first thing that we do is see the clinical aspect. Um, one thing that we're doing more and more is checking on the sagittal plane because if you look at her uh, uh, profile here, you know, it looks like a normal profile, but part of that is the, is the rotation of the ribs that are hiding really uh, the long lumbar curve that goes up to the thoracic level. She um, was treated with a brace. This is the outcome of uh, the brace that we made for her. It was a decent correction from 40 degrees to 10 degrees. It was not redone all at once. Uh, it was done within a week we got to this, to this uh, correction. And she was doing uh, really well um, for uh, several months. Also, you know, back back here actually, we get to see, you know, where the pelvis is in relationship to uh, to the trunk, and then how the trunk and the pelvis they are almost at the same uh, plane. <clears throat> Again, we talk about the sagittal posture. We didn't have any, a, a lateral uh, X-ray, mm, but uh, it looks uh, acceptable. When uh, when she we put monitors on ninety five percent of the braces, and if we look at if her target is twenty hours a day, she was getting only fifty percent of the target. She was not going to seventy or eighty, only fifty percent, and yet she had seventeen point uh, four hours a day but missing uh, a target. This information is relevant because three months later, we uh, saw that she uh, got the information that the brace was good, that the brace was working, and then she ended up going down to 13 hours, meaning she missed the target 75% plus um, out of the prescribed time in the brace. So this went from full-time to a part-time brace. Yet when um, we uh, look at her that she started with 40 degrees, uh, the six month in out of brace X-ray, she went down to 30 degrees. Good news? Yes, good news. But not really uh, uh, something that is sustainable if she keeps going only with uh, 13 hours or 12 hours. Um, embrace. So uh, after she saw this, she was happy. Summer, uh, it was a, a challenge for her because <clears throat> she had a lot of uh, activities to do. She ended up going uh, to um, um, a little bit more time. We'll see what happened by the, the end of her growth. Case number two is a female 10 years old. I saw her on November 22. Um, a adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, even though I thought you know it was a juvenile because of age, but um, a custom uh, Rigo Chenot <clears throat> was prescribed, and um, a research here, no there's available. Oh, one thing important: her her mom had a history of scoliosis. They already because she's so young, she had. At this point, a hundred percent of chance of getting to surgery because um, uh, of uh, uh, Sanders zero and uh, this magnitude of the curve. If we look at the sagittal profile, also, you know, not only how flat this is, but the lumbar, you know, is so pronounced. We can see right here and. Uh, when I asked her clinically to try to correct that lumbar posture, it was almost impossible for her such a way that she needed to flex her knees. 
So that tells me that trying to correct that uh, excessively, like the, the pelvic uh, incidents for her trying to correct that uh, will change the way she was standing. Probably she will be leaning forward or bending the knees constantly. This was the clinical presentation. Uh, this is the Adams test. I already did all the you know mapping, uh, drawing on the skin of uh, the blocks, and we can see imagine the block right there, the extension. Uh, we have also some lumbar, um, which change a little bit the way the brace needs to be designed. So the first brace uh, was done and uh, from 55 degrees on the thoracic, we went down to 34. Okay, decent correction, uh, not bad, but look at the X-ray and look at the shoulders. When I go back to the X-ray, the right shoulder is elevated in relationship to the left. So if I bring the, the, the left shoulder up, I'm giving a space for this block to kind of go in. And that um, it was achieved if I see the shoulder and the plastic of the brace right there, I'm going to the, the place where I need to apply that pressure. Shoulders are level, the left one is a little bit elevated and it, you know, it was great. Okay, correction, but this is the case where I mentioned that, that uh, three months, four months later, she came for a follow-up and she was not outgrowing the brace. She was getting some correction in the brace in such a way that she was getting taller. So we will be seeing correction on the upper block. And um, of course, when I talked to, uh, when I talked to uh, Luke and I said, I wanna make this brace again, uh, you know, he was like, absolutely. There was no charge for uh, the insurance or the patient. It was basically part of the, um, orthotic care and the commitment, you know, that Luke has for his clients. So uh, we made a new brace and in the new brace, you know, a little bit more elevation, but look at the correction that we have from uh, 55 to 15 degrees in brace. That's a significant correction. And uh, then uh, when she had the out of brace, X-ray, she went from being absolutely into range of surgery to being out of range of surgery. Now, of course, we know that if we stop treatment right now, she will go really fast to 50 and just keep going down the slope. But she is aware they are, like I said, spoon vendors, and uh, they're totally having control of this. 20 hours a day wearing the brace. So again, it's not what we're doing, it's what they are doing. We're just providers of information. Somebody was uh, uh, describing, we are like uh, the tour guide. Uh, I was trying to explain the difference between uh, delivering a brace and uh, the Rigo concept. The Rigo concept is, uh, it's like uh, one is I give you sandals and then there you go. The other one is, I give you the sandals. I, you know, first I ask you where do you want to go. So I give you the right sandals. Then I go with you. Then I show you the place. Then I get you to avoid, and I go there for the weekend or the time that you get to spend. That is as a concept instead of delivering just a brace. Uh, I don't have a, an X-ray on the sagittal, but I have clinical, and the clinical look at her right here. How she's standing in a really nice, beautiful way with the knees straight and uh, having a good control of her body here. You can see maybe a little bit of knee flexion, but um, that's the brace that currently she is wearing proudly. She went to one of those uh, uh, meetings um, this year and um, she was uh, wearing that brace uh, happily, showing everybody her results. Um, let's see what else we have here. The case number three. Uh, normally, uh, we talk about upper curves and how we make a lot of correction on the thoracic. The upper curve could uh, have some uh, influence and those curves are difficult to treat. Well, 
we have a case of a male, uh, 12 and a half years old. <clears throat> I saw him in April of this year, but he was already an existing client of Luke and uh, Luke uh, brought him up to, uh, you know, 22 degrees from uh, a little bit bigger of a curve, uh, a custom brace. Again, spoon benders all the way up to, uh, you know, square. Sanders for no other medical condition reported. And look at the at the clinical. So it's interesting because now that we look at the clinical, we can see rotation. So then we can see on the x-ray that makes sense the rotation with the little bit of curve that he has right there. Good. So then we get to address that. So we made a brace for him addressing that part, but also here at this part, there is something called demodification and a, 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 an adjustment on the brace or a demodifier type of uh, um, a modification that is done in the brace around this area, around this area, and even around this area. Look right here, the shape of this section compared to the other one right here. And what really happened is if I draw a line between uh, the first rib on the left, the first rib on the live, I will have uh, on the right, I will have uh, an inclination. The first rib and second rib, they are around here. So here we go. We did uh, the three out of four things that you know could be possible on the um, coronal plane to try to correct that curve without going to the neck with a, a Milwaukee type of frame. And um, uh, he was wearing the brace, and these are the results where we corrected all this, not only rotation, but uh, you know the, the curve that was uh, presenting right there. And also we had a significant correction on the upper curve. This kid wears the brace, puts stickers, tells people uh, about the brace and, and um, he's doing great. Case number four, male 15 year old, uh, seen in September of last year, custom uh, regal brace. He was, I don't know why I have research two, because when I look at the x-rays, um, he is like research four. And no, Sanders were not available. He's a competitive uh, uh, wrestler at the state level, and he had a lumbar spondylolysis. This is one of the kids that because of age and because of uh, uh, skeletal maturity, because he was already, you know, all the way up here to probably uh, reserve uh, four, you know, a let's avoid surgery would be enough. And, um, but he's competitive with everything, not only sports, but everything in life. He is a, a spoon bender with the obsession for doing everything right. So, uh, once I had a conversation with him, not even with his mom, his mom basically drives him, but he is the one that is making decisions on his health. And he said, no, I'm, we're going to do this. We're going to do this 20 hours. And um, this is the case that I presented initially that, um, you know, has some lateral inclination that the x-ray doesn't correspond to the clinical. And then uh, this is the brace that we made. Um, and at this point, we were working on trying to correct the um, the posterior alignment and becoming aware of that. So showing pictures, showing x-ray, and then doing some work in the mirror. I'm not doing physical therapy with them, but I'm just giving them information for them to uh, work at home. And uh, this was the embrace correction. A little bit hyper-corrected, two degrees. Mm. And uh, this is what he got uh, six months later. And he's not happy. He's like, okay, I want single digits. You know, he's uh, uh, 16 right now. He said, you know, I, I share with him some information that uh, to me, you know, has some level of relevance. It's like uh, skeletally mature, you are not all the way done because of uh, Sanders. This is still, I mean, uh, research is still open. Uh, you're a male, but also um, some people like Dr. Castellan that talks about not only uh, skeletal maturity, but uh, a disc uh, 
intervertebral disc maturity and how that cartilage takes longer to mature. So he has no issue wearing the brace 20 hours when his schedule doesn't allow him uh, to wear it, but only 18, then the next day he compensates. He could wear the brace 22 hours. All right, we're going to uh, the last section, which is the um, failure, the reason why braces fail. There is a, an article that was published and it talks about the um, review of different articles on um, the treatment of uh, uh, scoliosis with bracing, with braces and why, what are the factors, main factors reported of failure. So out of all these uh, factors, well, this study did a um, uh, collection of uh, possible uh, articles to review. There was a first selection and by the end, the criteria end up with 25 main articles uh, that were included in the study. This is the list and by far the biggest issue of failure again is compliance. Uh, the, these other factors, we don't have a, any um, possibility of changing them. Like I said, it's like the cards that were dealt to us, but the only two factors that we have to change or to uh, participate in is the compliance or the type of brace and the level of correction in brace. Not only the amount of correction, I could have a brace with really good correction, but I could have something like this. This is a patient that I saw, you know, a long time ago. And uh, when she came in, she came like four months later because five months later, because the, the curve got worse. She had a really good embrace correction. And when I saw her, uh, she had the brace on and I marked this dot right here, this dot right here, which is where she um, had the brace on that day. Now, this is the initial marker where she's supposed to wear the brace. Plus, patients normally, uh, when they increase the tightness, this mark ends up being this way. So the, the strap moves to a greater amount of tension. But in this case, it was just the opposite. Uh, look at uh, the amount of uh, correction that is being lost when I put that strap, those straps back where she was wearing. So all that forces, like pelvic translation is being lost, uh, the rotation forces are being lost. And it doesn't matter if she wears the brace 18 hours. She is not wearing the brace correctly. So those two, the compliance and the, the brace uh, are interrelated. Well, this is uh, the end of a basic conversation about the, the most frequent uh, questions. And, uh, you know, that's only my experience. And um, I want to thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Walter. It was uh, very educational. And I really like the comparison between the, uh, uh, the tr traditional TLSO braces and the European style. And you kind of really explained... Um, especially with the case presentations, how to tie everything together. So I appreciate that. Okay, let's ask a couple questions. With the brace study and with Dr. Weinstein, he was mentioning that bracing effectiveness was generally between 20 and 40 degree cob angles. And if it's above that, then the effectiveness of bracing tends to be, tends to drop off pretty quickly. What's your perspective on that? Okay. So I... I'm going to answer with an analogy, and the analogy is this. Um, in, in the year 1025, the earth was flat. It was considered, and everybody knew it was flat. So you will not dare to go to that gray area, to the limit. But oh, there, the one that dares to go there and explore that area, they may find that there is a new territory to explore. So I really believe that, um, and Dr. Um, uh, Smith from... Uh, uh, Houston, uh, he, uh, Dr. Brian Smith, he's actually the chair of the non-operative um, section of uh, uh, SRS. He's one of the proponents that we should probably extend the, you know, the cup angle to 20 and then, you know, go a little bit farther, you know, 
45 or even 50, uh, because the, it goes case by case. And when we have, like I said, a spoon vendor, they do wonderful things. You know, you, you saw one example, but the thing is for us, it's not abnormal for us. It's just something that we see daily. As long as they're doing what they're supposed to do, there is always a possibility to reverse the curve. Yeah, so another thing that is interesting to explore would be, um, and it's been happening in uh, in Russia. I went to Russia last year before the conflict, and I visited some uh, some guys, uh, five doctors that do bracing, and they are treating patients that are already skeletally mature, you know, 15 or 16 year old, all the way up to 20 with bracing. So uh, we don't explore that, but we don't explore that because um, probably there is not enough attention. However, I need to recognize, you know, uh, the Scoliosis Research Society as an organization because uh, this year they uh, confirmed their commitment to uh, pay attention to non-operative and to invest effort, time, and resources to explore more of this. Um, another question I had is, with respect to, again, the BRACE study indicating that um, it's by far the most important variable for bracing success is uh, patient compliance, um, you know, getting about 18 uh, hours of in-brace uh, wearing. Now, it also indicated in the graph that uh, you could have a, a cob angle correction, brace correction of 50%, you could have a 10%. But as long as you max out to 18 plus uh, hours of bracing, you kind of get the same results, right? So looking at it from uh, a different perspective, does it really matter what kind of brace you have if those if those numbers in terms of in brace uh, wearing tops off at 80 degrees for both? <laughs> I'm, I'm sending you a tricky question here. Well, there we go. Another analogy. Uh, let's say we're going to run around the block and we're going to do it this weekend. It's different that goal to, let's say, for Thanksgiving, we're going to do a 5K or the, by February, we're going to run a marathon. So for the running around, doesn't really matter what kind of shoes. Does it really matter what kind of equipment I have? Not really. If the goal is 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 a small, well, you know, it doesn't really matter what kind of brace, you know, do what you do. Let's say you're not a spoon vendor, you you just want to follow, you know, the basics. I I have cases of kids where you know they say, <clears throat> I am going to be um, in sports for a, a college, and I really don't care. The only thing that I care is not to have surgery. Or the one that wanted to be a pilot, he said, I really don't care about my spine. I just need to qualify and I cannot be beyond this point. But he was fine if he didn't wear a brace. So for, for those cases, it depends on the goal. If the goal is to do the minimum, any brace is okay. I have, you know, I have recommended, you know, nighttime brace. You know, normally I recommend the Rigo for, for the rotational component, but wear it only at night or only part-time. Just get up and watch TV if you want things that you cannot do with the night time, but, you know, go ahead and, and do that. But it all depends on the goal. So like I said in my presentation, it doesn't really matter the type of race. It is irrelevant. What, ma what matters is, uh, first, what is your goal? And second, who is going to, who is going to be your trainer? You know, who's going to make the race? Does it have yeah. enough experience? You know? Okay. Now, uh, another question is that from, well, two questions. So let's get into let's get into it a little bit. Now, I also feel that um, there are different practitioners um, that will do basically uh, body scans of a of a patient and then set up that send out that 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 data um, to a manufacturer, and manufacturer builds it, sends it back, and that's the brace, right? Meanwhile, you'll have orthodists who actually hand make uh, the brace from that data and they're working hands-on with the patient itself. It's, I guess it's uh, the spoon benders, which I am a spoon bender myself, of course, and it's a good thing. So I find that every 
whether you're a PT, you're an orthopedist, or you're a spine surgeon, you actually want a patient who's a spine bend, spoon bender because they're educated and you can take it to a different level in terms of um, communication, right? And shared decision-making, of course. But with respect to my question, um, how, do you, uh, how do you reconcile that in terms of, well, you can take it from there. You know what I'm trying to say. When you have yeah, hands-on yeah. hands -on measurement versus a scan and send out to the lab and how do they, what's your perspective on that? Well, Derek, this is an interesting question. A few months ago, I put a presentation together called scoliosis. Who cares? Who really cares? The intention of the presentation was to um, talk about the levels of expertise of people making braces for scoliosis. Now, I uh, make that presentation particularly for the regal type of concept because that's what I do 90% of the time. So it was arbitrary. I choose from one to five, and that scale goes like this. Number five at the top is uh, uh, who can make the braces, uh, the Rigo concept, if it's not Manuel Rigo. So that's uh, number five. Um, number four is a group of people that have spent uh, you know, several months either continuously or uh, you know, adding year after year, spending months or seminars with Dr. Rigo or direct training with Dr. Rigo. So there is uh, someone in Serbia, uh, Dr. Amina, it's a, a, a PM&R doctor, and she spent one year working with um, uh, Dr. Rigo, duplicating case by case. Um, there is uh, uh, Luke Skytleather that... Uh, has been going to uh, Bufa to help um, Dr. Rigo train some other people. And uh, he also was the first one to go to Barcelona and they brought the, uh, the Rigo concept to the States. Um, there are several others. Now, in this group that I called number four, there is at least five years of experience these people can do evaluation, uh, you know, taking of uh, data and information for, to make the brace, um, classification, design of the brace. They fabricate the brace themselves. Then they do the fitting themselves and they do adjustments, you know, follow-ups with adjustments. They are also able to identify if there is another brace that is not working properly, even if it's called a Rico type of brace. And at this level, they can make braces for somebody else. Okay, the next level down on expertise will be uh, number three. It's people, you know, these practitioners that are seeing a fair amount of patients, let's say at least two or three uh, a week, and they're in the process of learning how to make the brace. The brace. They have a men mentor, and they know how to do evaluation, and they can do the product from beginning to end. Up to this point is the level of uh, you know a specialist, but not in a formal way, in an informal way of saying you know these people are specialists. From that point on, you know, uh, number two and number one are generalists that are just you know, fill in an order. So number two will be people that they don't make the brace. They just collect the data for somebody else to make the brace. They collect the data. They basically follow the, the recipe of, you know, getting a scanning, getting the measurements, maybe some other extra data, and then send it to a central fabrication, even if that is internally in their company or externally somebody else. They don't know how to make the brace. When they receive the brace, they say, okay, almost like uh, the other scale that I had of uh, uh, spoon benders, followers, and the, it is okay. 
that also applies for practitioner. This group number two is in that it is okay, whatever the expert says, and then if things go wrong, I will blame the expert, which is central fabrication. And number one is that one that is just fulfilling the order, doesn't know about classification, is not an expert, maybe sees one case, you know, every week, every two weeks, doesn't, it is not interested in getting a level of expertise in, uh, in bracing. It's just like one of many other things that he does in the practice. So when you get to choose where to go, uh, the questions, if you, you know, want to do the question is like, uh, are you guys experts? Meaning, you know, how many braces do you make a week? Uh, do you do any other, uh, uh, you know, braces or orthotics or prosthetics or only scoliosis that puts things in perspective? Um, who were you trained? Uh, have you uh, visit Dr. Rigo or his school? Um, oh, in uh, in uh, in Germany, which is like a one week training, which is not absolutely you know like enough to to learn how to make the brace. It's just enough to capture information, but then additional training is needed. So that's in general what uh, what I will say about. It. And again, the good news is that um, uh, with uh, BSPTS, we're working on creating a school for physicians, therapists, and orthotists to be trained as a group. If I want to extend a little bit this conversation, that's the danger of having doctors that don't know what's the difference or you know what to look for. They don't know if, if it's an expert or not. So one of the things that also I heard one of uh, my mentors say is the physician should go and visit the practice you know, the location where the braces are being made. So they have an idea that, you know, go and see a case. Just devote one morning to go and see who who are you partnering with to make braces. Yeah, it's just like anything else in life. You know, like, do you play golf? I do. How often? Not that often. I, you know, I don't care that much about it. It's just, you know, something that I do. But for what I do, my spoon benderness, you know, is in what I do for a living. Um, I like Luke because he shares the same thing. Luke is working at 6.30 in the morning and then he's the last one to leave and he's hands-on doing work. He's not just telling people and, and you know, collecting. Um, it's totally different. So I think this... Um, once you once you want a goal that is really at a high level, you want the best uh, trainer, the best orthotist, you know, someone that is going to be there. There is a huge difference between um, having a evaluation, physical evaluation, when you're training this concept versus just taking measurements, pictures, and send it to somebody else. Uh, last year, um, I was invited to uh, the BSPTS teachers uh, conference they have done a conference where all the teachers around the globe gets together and i was talking about how can we assess flexibility because listen to this we don't have a scale of flexibility to know how much to correct not even the surgeons so i asked surgeons last year at the srs meeting uh, how do you assess uh, flexibility well even um uh, uh, you know uh, Dr. Linky, he was saying he's not using the lateral bending anymore because it's unreliable. He he's not doing that. I asked him personally, like, why is that? He said, well, the X-ray technician doesn't want the body out of the cassette, so they're not. It's, it's not reliable. It doesn't make sense. Uh, other, so we don't have that. But then this year and and last year, thinking about it, Dr. Rigo, when he's doing, he probably he's not even aware of that. But he's touching the patient on the physical assessment and he's doing some of the physical therapy kind of thing. And he's doing he's doing this. It's almost like like trying to figure if the body is giving or not. So it becomes to a, to that kind of, 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 of talent, right? To know how much you can you can push. So some of that is mechanical, some of that is talent. 
um, I came to uh, the States uh, as a physical therapist. And one of my first jobs was working at an orthopedic uh, center. And there was a physical therapist there that she will work with patients efficiently. She will ask them to do machines. She will do progress notes, finish with the patient, but never touch the patient. And then there were some other patients, some other patients that love the other therapists because they were hands on, they were working on, they, they felt they were being treated. So it's something like that. Um, I think that we cannot do all the braces when we want to. We have, we were basically, what we want to uh, expand is the amount of knowledge. We want the right people to come to us. We wish we could fire the, the patients that are not really doing the work, you know. There is one patient that keeps coming to us and uh, she doesn't wear the brace, but only like eight hours. And the worst is that the curve is getting worse and worse. But uh, we keep seeing her, but this time that we meet for somebody else that is really a spoon vendor. So it, it, it just goes how you handle that. How, what, what is your goal for life? This morning I was thinking, okay, I'm going to have this meeting with the Derek today. What's my intention? My intention is to give information to families. When we have the intention clear, that's fine. If the intention is, I want to see a lot of patients, I want to be super rich, I want to, you know, that's a different intention for different people. All right, Walter, that's my last question. I think we're getting close to two hours with this. Um, I think I'll have to split it in uh, four pieces here. <laughs> Interviews. <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks, again, thanks again so much for your time. Appreciate it. And I appreciate the, uh, the time and effort you spent on uh, creating your presentation. Thank you so much. My, my pleasure. Okay.